The first thing you notice is the echo to your steps. The way each footfall quietly moves through the halls all around you. It's striking enough that you know only a couple sets of feet would create a sound like a stampede, but there are no other sets. It's just you. The air is warm, the tiled walls are wet, and the sound of trickling water leaks from every shadowed room. This place is beautiful and horrifying all at once, and it is yours to wander through. You are alone. The place that I'm describing is a place known as the Pool Rooms, a series of strangely constructed and abstractly connected rooms designed in a style oddly reminiscent of every indoor pool you've ever been to, complete with metal handrails and shifting lukewarm water. It's a place steeped in atmosphere, one that you might have a hard time defining. It's also a place you'll never be able to see in real life, because it doesn't exist. In the internet horror community, there are a few different creative mediums which have become more and more popular over the years. Trends that have emerged and blossomed into vibrant and recognizable standouts in an ever-changing creative landscape. The analog horror trend, and its sister, the digital horror trend. A resurgence of found footage filled with new twists and modern expressions of horror. ARGs, or alternate reality games, with their sirens calls of deeper mystery to be unlocked. These trends have all grown to represent internet horror at large as it's moved from a completely niche section of the World Wide Web to a sizable and active community of talented and passionate individuals. To those in the community, which probably includes you if you're watching this video, these genres and the individual creations which helped cultivate them are immediately recognizable. Who in this community didn't at one point find themselves lost in the Marble Hornets mythos or the Everyman Hybrid storyline? Who was able to fight the urge to get lost in the grainy and disorienting worlds of the Mandela Catalog or the Walton Files? The genre is rich with interesting ideas and talented creators who work to make the face of internet horror immediately recognizable. I love every part of the internet horror community, from the commentary channels to the filmmakers, but there's one aspect of it that has always caught my attention above all the rest. Liminal spaces. The concept of liminality was coined in 1909 by a French ethnographer named Arnold van Gennep in his publication of the book Rites du Passage, easily translated to Rites of Passage. In it, he established liminality as the quality of ambiguity or disorientation that occurs in the middle stage of a rite of passage when an individual leaves one group to become part of another. Is this the definition you expected to hear? It's interesting the components of it that are seemingly missing from our new modern understanding of liminality, specifically the disorientation of one moving between groups. Our current understanding of liminality, and specifically liminal spaces, has to do mostly with evocative and eerie scenes of emptiness or obscurity. They tend to be photos of places that are usually moved through without much thought, locations that might be otherwise thought of as normal if not for the moody lighting, dismal presentation, and striking lack of human presence. I talked a lot in my last video about the intoxicatingly strange phenomenon of human absence as it relates to horror and art, and that concept is very easily applied to that of liminal spaces. A photo of a children's play place is normally a happy and vibrant photo, a memory of a fun birthday party or event, filled with the blurred forms of excited kids and bright colors. But if you remove the children, take all the energy and positive association out of the photo, take down the lights and snap a photo with flash, suddenly you've reframed this place in a new light, one which realistically few people have been able to see it in. Obviously, there's nothing dangerous about an empty play place. Logically, we can understand that these kinds of businesses have to close at some point every day, and that the structures sit unused and empty at night, and yet we're still strangely affected by the presentation of the scene. It's a familiar place suddenly made unfamiliar again. The phenomenon I want to talk about here is that feeling, the one you get while you're looking at one of these images. A liminal space photo is compelling not just because it's unsettling. If that were the case, there would be nothing to separate it from the many other horrifying image-based communities online. No, we're drawn to liminal spaces for a more cosmic reason. Despite the danger, the uncertainty, the awareness that something is clearly off, there is a longing, a subconscious call to come home. We love liminal horror because we long for impossible places. Nostalgia is a really fascinating experience because it's something we like to call a mixed emotion. There have been multiple studies conducted on the experience of nostalgia which imply that it can be both beneficial or detrimental to someone's existence, depending on how that nostalgia is introduced. Obviously, going back to a happy memory can be soothing or therapeutic, but it can also create feelings of longing or regret in us. 
If a moment became important to us after the fact, thinking back to it and our failure to recognize the gravity of the moment can be a frustrating exercise. Or if the memory represents something we used to have, a relationship, a family member, even a house or job, which is gone now, the pleasant experience of looking back can be invaded by a cacophony of should-haves and what-ifs. It's not exactly dangerous, but it is addictive. Good or bad, there's something supernaturally compelling about the call of the past. I talked briefly in my quiet horror essay about how Skinnamarink utilized our childhood memories to present a new form of horror to us. In Skinnamarink, to recap, our two protagonists are young children dealing with supernatural forces outside their understanding, and the movie frames the entire story around their experience of the situation. The way their fear is muted by a lack of understanding, the way they attempt to continue with their familiar routines until that is made impossible, the choice to present the story through static and fuzz, which encapsulates our analog memories, those pictures and videos of an early childhood. All of these tricks are skinnamarink using nostalgia to create a compelling and unique atmosphere, and it does it in quite the same way that liminal space photos do. Consider this photo. It's a fairly popular image in the community. Looking at this photo, I'm immediately brought back to a much simpler and yet much scarier time in my life. The time when I was a young child. The memories of which at this point might as well be artificial for how grainy and nonsensical they seem. And yet, the emotion attached to them is very real. That pleasant ache in the chest, the reminder of a time long gone. How is this photo able to accomplish this? Well, let's go through it. The first, most obvious thing is the actual subject of the photo. It appears to be the basement of an American suburban home. If you grew up in this country, you've almost certainly encountered a room exactly like this one, with its beige paint and vacuum tracked similarly colored carpeting, the white wooden doors and the warm wood railings. It's undeniably familiar. Mix that familiarity with the angle of the photo, clearly shot from a lower position so that each doorway clearly reaches much higher than the camera. It's the angle of a child, the angle we'd be so used to seeing a place like this from. There's a graininess to the photo, implying the usage of an older camera, and not the high-detail lens of a smartphone we've gotten used to in the modern era. To me, and the majority of my channel demographic, this puts the time of capture at around the time we'd have been a younger child. Looking at this picture is like looking at a picture of your childhood home in a photo album, where even the photos are showing their age. Shadows play an important role in the composition of this piece as well, most strikingly the open door in the left part of the image, as well as the stairway up. In this nostalgic state, we might be reminded how much more of a threat shadows used to be when we were younger. The open door could hide anything. A monster, an angry person, or just another room. If we were unsure as children, we suddenly become unsure now, as we inhabit this younger version of our mind. The emptiness of the room is particularly interesting, the lack of furniture or decoration. It reminds us of the time just before moving out of a house or just after moving in, and suddenly, Gnep's middle stage explanation begins to make a lot more sense. Whichever way you slice it, this photo captures the in-between moment of a huge transition. People move around all the time, but moving when you're a child is a special experience. For one thing, you very rarely have any control over it. Maybe a guardian got a new job, maybe something happened to the old house, it doesn't matter. You get dragged along in the process just the same. Seeing the old familiar place stripped of its defining features, or seeing a new place with nothing to give it the context of a home, either or both of these experiences stick to the mind of a child for a long time until that memory, shifted and warped by the years, becomes nostalgia, whether the original experience was one of excitement or dread. Every part of this photo is reminiscent of a place that you must have seen once, even if you can't conjure up the precise memory anymore. There's a part of me that longs to be in the space depicted in this photo, or perhaps more accurately, the time. Because that's what nostalgia is, isn't it? A quick journey back in time to something you miss? Only, this photo isn't of a place I actually know. The nostalgia is false, and so while I'm partially comforted by this picture, I'm also almost afraid of it. Of how it plays with my memories, almost fakes them, in quite the same way I have to for other memories in the photo album. But isn't this video supposed to be about impossible places? Couldn't you find a place like this in the basement of just about any house in the American suburbs? And the answer is yes and no. Yes, you can find a carpeted basement with very little effort in this country. Go to any open house and you've got a significant chance of encountering a place very similar to this. But it won't be the same. The impossibility represented here isn't tied to the space so much as it is tied to our experience with it. No matter how many basements you find, no matter how similar they are to the ones you've been in before, no place will ever make you feel the way it did when you were a child. Because that child is gone. As mentioned before, nostalgia is a two-way street. It's not always tied to happiness. 
A photo like this might create comfort in one individual who experienced a happy childhood, but to someone who was less lucky, this picture might represent a much more sinister part of their history. If home has always meant comfort to you, then so might a picture like this, with the potential of experiencing uneasiness created by the additional elements we talked about earlier in the video. But if home meant anything less than comfort, looking at a photo like this might conjure a much darker emotion than otherwise. The ambiguity of the shadowy places is made that much more dramatic, the question of what's upstairs that much more alarming. For people with this connection to reality-based liminal spaces, the appeal might be less present than with other, more ethereal, impossible places. So now, let's break away from the physical spaces of reality and look at some completely unreachable zones of interest. Minecraft is one of those games that never really leaves you. I think most people probably started playing when they were a kid, but unless they fully gave up gaming at some point on the road to adulthood, it's not really one of those games you stop playing. It hits in waves, sure, but the appeal never really goes away. It's a fantastic game for a lot of reasons. The ability to create whatever you want, to play with other people on your terms, to get lost in the atmosphere, these sensations are appealing to anyone with a bit of creative drive or an interest in that style of game progression. And so, is it any surprise that occasionally one can find themselves overwhelmed with the urge to climb inside the game and make that their reality, even just temporarily? I know I have. The atmosphere of Minecraft, as mentioned before, is incredible, and varied depending on where and how you're playing. On a server with friends, there's a level of humor and chaos present that elevates your time with Minecraft past that of a game and into the role of a kind of social media experience. Playing single player, however, is a different beast entirely. The sound design of the game is perfect. How every step you take, whether on grass or stone or wood, resonates in familiar tones. The way rain hammers on the roof of your base in a softer thrum than if you were standing outside. The clucks and squeals of wildlife or farm animals drifting through your ears as you set about on whatever task you're completing. You're brought wholly and completely into the world, and you feel it. If you're playing with music enabled, which I always recommend, that experience is occasionally added to by the haunting and familiar tunes of C418. I know that this particular brand of nostalgia exists because of the videos I've seen on YouTube. An hour-long video by Isaac Y entitled, You Fell Asleep With Minecraft Open On A Cool 2012 Midsummer Night, has 4.5 million views. People remember this game fondly, and especially remember the feeling of playing it as a kid. The innocence and the curiosity about a new game with a growing community of content creators and modders. The urban legends which began to appear. Herobrine, the eeriness of it all. And there is an eeriness to Minecraft which can't be denied. It seems intentional. There's a constant implication made by the game about a deeper lore you just don't seem to have access to. The music is lonely at its best and genuinely unnerving at its worst. The way physics works, the floating islands, the way things just hover in the sky, the ruins, the temples, the abandoned mines, all of it makes you wonder what, or who, existed here before you, and where they went. See my last essay if you want more of that. The game is full of both of these experiences, the calming and the unsettling, and it all comes together to create an intoxicating feeling of depth and complexity, a feeling that is so inviting and alluring you wish you could explore it yourself. I've experienced the strange urge, while wandering around a base I was particularly proud of, to push through the screen and inhabit that space in real life. It's a strange urge, and a kind of sad one. It's an impulse you know is impossible to act on. This isn't like the photo of the basement. This space doesn't exist. So let's return to the pool rooms, to the space I mentioned in the intro. The pool rooms are a part of the deeper backrooms lore, a lore which I am not very educated on. That's okay, the lore is not really the part I'm focused on with this. I'm really into the concept of the pool rooms, just based on the few photos I stumbled upon in my journeys across the internet. I've really enjoyed the aesthetic of Vaporwave for a while, and if you know anything about Vaporwave, you know there's a weird section of the aesthetic which is really into pools. It's something about their simple tile design, the association with hotel pools and travel, the hot tropical vacations. There's just something inherently chill about encountering an empty pool. It becomes meditative even if you don't want it to be. So, while browsing through the aesthetic, I encountered the images of the pool rooms and was immediately struck with a deep longing to be in that space. I have a sort of happy place I like to go to when I'm stressed out. A fantasy location in my mind that is just a pool lit by warm evening light. The trickles of water echo against the warm air, and I'm able to stay there for as long as I'd like. This is a place I will never reach. Except, the pool rooms capture almost exactly the space I was imagining to such a strange degree that I'm almost convinced that it's not a fantasy, it's a memory. The photos online are proof of a place that I've seen in my mind, except well, I know that it isn't true. 
Do two seconds of research or three seconds of thinking and obviously the pool rooms aren't real. How could they be? How insane to long for a space that I've never been, can never be in, and does not exist. The footage you've been seeing in the background of this video is from the demo of a game called Dreamcore. It looks like there are going to be more levels in the future, and I'm excited to see them, but the one that does exist is, as you might have guessed, the pool rooms. The game presents the space to you in a way quite similar to the series created by Kane Pixels, even paying homage to the intro of the series with their own tilted title screen. Playing through the game was incredibly strange for me. The dev team, Montrelaz, did a great job on the map. The place is huge, and it feels like it. The game is incredibly simple, essentially just a walking simulator, but it had me completely absorbed. It was the closest I've ever felt to actually being able to inhabit one of these impossible spaces, and yet, there was a degree of separation between me and the environment, the degree that would always be there. But of course, the reality of inhabiting a space like this is one of intense horror. For as much as the design resembles something man-made, the space is absolutely not meant to be inhabited. It's unclear whether the space is truly meant for anything, but despite the calming presentation of the environment, there's nothing friendly here. There's no food, you'd starve after a while, no beds or couches, so unless you wanted to sleep in the water, you'd be stuck on the hard tile. Who knows if you could drink the water, or if you'd want to. Your reality would quickly become a nightmare if trapped here. It's impossible to imagine inhabiting a space like this for a long time. In Piranesi, by Susanna Clarke, the titular protagonist lives in a place he calls The House. It's a massive building with many floors, the top of which are full of clouds, and the bottom of which are filled with ocean. Every floor is made up entirely of massive hallways full of marble statues. It is the entire world, as far as Piranesi is concerned. Now, I won't spoil the plot of the book here because it's definitely one I'd recommend reading, but I have to bring it up because there's so much about this story that reminds me of the pool rooms, or even the back rooms. Really, just any of these impossible, unexplained spaces. Living on Earth is a wild experience because while it's incredibly chaotic and hard to understand, I know that there's an explanation for just about everything's existence. And this isn't a theology discussion. Whether or not we were created intentionally doesn't matter in this moment. What I really mean is that every space, which has an obvious human design, also has a clear intention attached to it. A house was made for people to live in, a shed was made to store stuff in, an office for working in. A hallway is such a human concept, a thing outside nature which only exists in the context of human architecture, and therefore, it's impossible to encounter a hallway for no reason. If a hallway exists in a building, it's because it was intentionally added to it so you can get from one part of the building to another. And that's why, to focus on another book briefly, in Mark Z. Danielewski's House of Leaves, my favorite book, it's so unsettling to the Navidson family when a new hallway appears in their house while they're away on vacation. House of Leaves is a book all about impossible spaces, and further, about those impossible spaces existing despite whatever impossibility we may claim. It gets way more involved later in the book, but let's fixate on this hallway. Of course, there's an obvious spook here, a sudden architectural shift with no explanation, reminiscent of the initial horror of Skinamarink, which I imagine had to have been at least partially inspired by House of Leaves. But beyond that immediate spook is a deeper, more existential question. For what purpose was this put here? It's not like a new room was added. If I understand the text correctly, it's simply another door and bit of wall separating one room further from the other, and not otherwise changing anything. If a new bedroom appeared, that would be one thing, an architectural shift that, while weird, did create a new space for someone to sleep in, but this hallway doesn't add anything to the space. It doesn't have a point, it's simply a recontextualization of something which already existed, walls built around a space for no reason. This is the same strangeness that encapsulates the setting of Piranesi, as well as places like the pool rooms or the back rooms. The design is strikingly familiar, and implicative of a human architect, and yet, by the lore or the premise of the setting alone, we know it couldn't have been. And so, it becomes a cycle of questioning. Did someone intentionally make this place? Well, of course not, that would be impossible. If a human didn't intentionally make this place, though, why does its design so deeply resemble familiar human architecture? There must be something intentional about this space. And so on and so forth. There's no satisfying answer. I've been doing a kind of seesaw here, presenting each of these places first as inviting, then as unsettling, then sometimes getting back to inviting again. A lot of the places that call out to me straddle the line between atmospheric and dangerous. And the interesting thing is, so does reality sometimes. Some of my favorite real-life liminal spaces are parks in the middle of the night. 
A lot like the play places mentioned in the start of this video, there's something so compelling about seeing a place that is normally so full of color and energy covered in a silent darkness. Walking around a playground, sitting on a creaking swing, hearing the wind blowing through the rusted chains, it's both very surreal and very calming, especially if it's a park I'm very familiar with. There is, of course, a very real danger to walking around at night by yourself. Humans are a much more real and dangerous threat than whatever you might imagine lurking in the back rooms, and the night is one of the best times to meet some of the worst humans, if you're unlucky. It seems like all the places that call to us are dangerous, but that isn't the case. I think it probably seems that way because to so many of us in the community, answers are more alluring than safety, and most of our questions have to do with pretty unsavory things like death or horror. There's a phenomenon called the call of the void, which essentially refers to the urge we might have to hurl ourselves over tall ledges or to step off the roof of a skyscraper, despite our own self-preserving instincts. Of course, the majority of us don't want to die, and yet subconsciously there's a part of us which is drawn to our own destruction. I think this call is a similar one to what we experience with these impossible places. There's a mystery inherent to all of them, a question which can only be answered through the total loss of regular life, through habitation. We feel like the only way to understand these spaces is to live in them, and even if we know how bad that living could be, the urge remains present. I'm someone who values escapism a lot. When I read, I read fiction, and that's because fiction is the closest you ever get to leaving this reality and becoming part of another one. This urge to escape the struggles of the modern era, the stresses of the election, the tragedies across the globe by entering a completely non-real universe with perhaps its own problems, but different problems nonetheless, it's incredibly alluring. All of these spaces are alluring in that specific way, so clearly separate and removed from the drama of our own world that those dissatisfied with the way things are going in that world can't help but long for what's on the other side of the fictional barrier. It is that same removed quality that also makes these places so eerie. Their separation from all that we know is both inviting and intimidating. It's a shame, knowing that I'll never walk the halls of the pool rooms. I would like to very badly. But I also know the place in me that that feeling comes from. The same place that is willing to throw everything I know away to escape reality. It's a volatile section of my personality. It's fun to spend time with nostalgia, to explore liminal spaces to the best of our abilities and try to understand what makes them so interesting to us, but we can't allow ourselves to become lost in it. Or maybe we can, it might not matter. The call of impossible places is hard to ignore, and if we finally found the way into one, the world would never be the same. Hello! If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate it. I work really hard on these things, and uh, any support uh, means the world to me. So, once again, thank you for that. If you like the music in this video, that uh, is music that I made, and you can go find it on Spotify or Apple Music or whatever under the name Bosch. The link is usually in the description of these videos, and it should be for this one too, so you can go check it out there. If, if you like this video, please like and subscribe. It really helps me out. I'm trying to grow this channel, and just any support, again, really helps out. So I don't really have any huge announcements today. So just thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye guys.